Welcome everyone to the Cancer Research Institute's Patient Immunotherapy Summit. I'm Tamron Hall, and once again, I'm hosting this important event so together we can learn about immunotherapy, a revolutionary cancer treatment that is saving lives. Many of you are here because you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer. So let me start off by expressing how very sorry I am that you're going through this. The Cancer Research Institute is committed to fighting against this devastating disease together with you. For over 70 years, CRI has been relentlessly researching, innovating, and delivering results with the mission to create a world immune to cancer. Thanks to CRI, 28 types of cancers can be treated with immunotherapy today, and more than 4 million patients are eligible to benefit from its research every year working with scientific experts, oncologists, doctors, supporters, patients, and advocates, CRI funds the best and most promising scientists worldwide. Starting today, you can access each session of this entire program at any time for free, available at CRI's website, cancerresearch.org. The Cancer Research Institute also offers free and confidential consultations in English and Spanish, to explore your treatment options and connect you with CRI's navigators who can help you find a clinical trial that may be right for you or your loved one. To find a clinical trial for you or a loved one, visit our website at cancerresearch.org slash cancer clinical dash trials. The Cancer Research Institute offers this unique program free of charge to you thanks to the generous support of sponsors who share CRI's commitment to help patients and caregivers like you access information you can trust. Now get ready to learn from top oncologists about the way immunotherapy works and how it's changing the way cancer is treated. You will hear from experts on specific cancer types, as well as those who have responded outstandingly well to treatments. Featured patients will share their honest and insightful stories on how immunotherapy helped them in their journey to overcome cancer. You'll also learn about the importance of participating in clinical trials and how to access them. We know your journey won't be easy, but we hope this event brings you helpful information, answers, hope, and empowerment to be in control of your treatment. Let me introduce you to internationally acclaimed oncologist, Dr. Jed Walchok who has been instrumental in immunotherapy innovations, particularly in the realm of melanoma clinical trials and treatments. Dr. Walchuk is the director of the Sandra and Edward Meyer Cancer Center and a professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. He is an associate director of CRI's Scientific Advisory Council. Dr. Walchuk will present us with an immunotherapy review to better understand the power of this remarkable treatment. Hello, my name is Dr. Jed Walchuk, and I'm the director of the Meyer Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian Hospital. I am so happy to be part of the Cancer Research Institute's uh, Patient Immunotherapy Summit. Um, this is uh, a, a frequent event for me, and I always enjoy it very much. Um, I have been a supporter and a person who has been supported by the Cancer Research Institute for many years in their many decades long quest to figure out the best way to use the immune system as a novel way to control cancer. Um, and by bringing information to patients, families, and caregivers in settings such as this, uh, we hope to raise awareness around the possibility of using immunotherapy for different cancers and the importance of clinical research to answer new questions. So what is immunotherapy? Well, I think most people are aware that cancer has traditionally been treated using surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, which have one major theme in common, and that is that all of those treatment modalities treat the tumor directly. Um, and for many decades, they have been quite successful in controlling several different kinds of cancer. However, there have always been diseases that the currently available treatments at the time were not yet sufficient. 
and four. And um, that was one of the reasons why attention was turned to immunotherapy several decades ago. Now, the idea of using the immune system as a way to control a dangerous disease is, of course, not new. I think the past few years have taught us how powerful the immune system can be in controlling infectious diseases such as COVID-19 and how immunotherapies like vaccines can be the cornerstone of control of an otherwise dangerous disease. However, uh, for cancer, uh, immunotherapy uh, has taken longer to mature. How we now, though, have several medicines which are currently available as standard treatments um, that use the immune system as a way to treat cancer, and many others in development. So, how do the current immunotherapy medicines work? The way that I like to consider this question is that it is very much like starting your car. It takes multiple actions in order to get your car started. You have to um, insert the ignition key if you have a, a classic car or press the button on the key fob if you have a more modern car. You then have to uh, hit the accelerator um, and then the car will move. However, once that happens, um, if you don't have a brake on the car, then I think everybody is headed for trouble. And the same type of analogy is true for the immune system. We have very specific locks or um, key pods um, that control the immune system that turns it on only when it sees a target of interest. Um, we also have accelerator pedals called activation pathways that get the immune system moving more quickly. And then we also have brakes. And in the year 2018, uh, one of my colleagues and the chair of the CRI Scientific Advisory Council, Dr. Jim Allison, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology, along with one of his colleagues, T Professor Tasuku Hanjo, for their idea of cutting off the brakes as a way to allow the immune system to move quicker and try to catch up with cancer. And the class of medicines that were developed as a result of the very elegant science that professors Allison and Hanjo were pursuing are called checkpoint blocking antibodies. And there are several of these that are currently in use for numerous different kinds of cancer. Now, the way that these medicines work is they allow the immune system to run at really a, a quicker pace than it otherwise would. Um, and in some cases, the cancers have been controlled or even eliminated. Um, the disease where I have seen this most clearly um, is in a skin cancer called metastatic melanoma. Um, this is the disease that my clinical practice is focused on. Um, it is one of several different kinds of skin cancer. Although it is not uh, the most common kind of skin cancer, it is the most common cause of skin cancer-related death. And that's really because if melanoma is not surgically removed at a very early stage in its development, it can spread to different organs where it uh, um, forms metastases um, that are difficult to control. Now, when these immunotherapies, checkpoint blocking antibodies as they're called, were first explored in clinical trials, we uh, asked some people with very advanced melanoma to participate in these clinical research studies. And some of those patients had long lasting remissions, which are still in place today. One of the first patients who I treated back in 2005 is still alive and well. She's had two children and she's living a wonderful life. Um, that is, uh, of course, not the case for every person, but between 2005, when I first met this person, and now in 2023, somewhere around 50% of people with very advanced melanoma will have a significant regression, if not a long-term disease control, um, with the use of these immunotherapies. And that has made a fundamental difference in the amount of hope that we have around diagnoses such as advanced melanoma. What used to be a disease that unfortunately led to people dying within six to seven months, now the average life expectancy of someone with advanced melanoma is just a little bit over six years. 
Um, there are still people for whom these treatments do not work well enough, and that is the reason why more research is needed. But in general, um, the mood um, in my clinic, uh, in the waiting room for my clinical practice, um, is much different than it was when I started in the year 2000. Um, and fortunately, the early successes of immunotherapy and melanoma gave rise to exploration of these medicines in other diseases, such as lung cancer, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, some types of lymphoma like Hodgkin lymphoma, um, upper gastrointestinal cancers uh, like esophageal or stomach cancer, um, and head and neck cancer. In addition, other skin cancers such as advanced squamous cell cancer of the skin has also been shown to be sensitive to immunotherapy. So we now um, have an idea of the kinds of cancers that immunotherapy is useful for, and we are beginning to understand why it is those cancers that are sensitive to immunotherapy. The fundamental reason that we believe right now is that cancers that have a, um, a higher degree of genetic damage associated with them, the more their genes have been harmed, by the carcinogens that were involved in forming the cancer. In the case of melanoma and squamous cell cancer, in most people that is ultraviolet light from the sun. In people who have bladder cancer or lung cancer, that is most likely, uh, although not always, the carcinogens that are in tobacco smoke. And so the more genetic damage a tumor has, the more abnormal it looks to the immune system. And since the immune system is programmed to distinguish things that look normal from those that are abnormal, say, you know, a virus compared to a normal cell, um, the immune system is more likely to see cancers that have a higher degree of damage. And therefore, if we give a person an immunotherapy, it is more likely um, to have a beneficial effect. So that's all, you know, very encouraging news. But like any medical treatment, we also have recognized that there are relatively uncommon toxicities of this kind of cancer therapy, um, uncommon because they don't look like um, the normal side effects of cancer treatment. So we don't see so much loss of hair, we don't see so much low blood count or nausea and vomiting like we see with other kinds of cancer treatment. But what we do see quite commonly are areas of inflammation uh, that form as a result of the immunotherapy. And this is a really a, a mechanism-based side effect of the immune system operating at a higher level. So we see rashes from inflammation of the skin. We see diarrhea from inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes we see abnormal blood tests showing inflammation of the liver or some of the glands, like the thyroid gland in the neck. Um, and those can be quite common, and they also can be, in most cases, easily controlled with the use of immune-suppressing medicines. The cornerstone of good control of these side effects is great communication between the person being treated and their treatment team. So we don't want to hear about things after the symptoms have been going on for weeks. We want to know about them after they've been going on for hours so that we can intervene quickly and reverse the symptoms very, very rapidly and easily. So we have come quite a long way with immunotherapy in this class of medicines. Um, we, we now um, are starting to talk about cures in people who are alive 15 years after a devastating diagnosis like metastatic melanoma. But we're also aware that there are people who need newer treatment approaches. And where that's leading us is to other immune pathways, treatments that instead of cutting off the breaks, hit the accelerator a little bit harder. We are also um, using what are called engineered cell therapies, essentially transfusions of white blood cells that have been 
um, molecularly engineered in the laboratory to specifically see cancers. One kind of these engineered immune cells are called CAR T cells, um, and these are currently available as a standard treatment for some leukemias and lymphomas and have been shown to be quite effective. We have as um, one of our very high priority goals figuring out ways to use engineered cell therapy for common solid tumors like um, colon cancer or breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, diseases for which the currently available immunotherapies are not highly effective. Um, and important to all of that um, is the um, the participation in research. And that's, of course, where folks like myself who um, uh, run laboratories um, or clinical trials um, get very valued support from organizations like the Cancer Research Institute to carry out this mission. But importantly, we also want to make the general public aware of the importance of clinical research, that participating in clinical trials is one of the ways that we can make quicker progress. There are various ways that people can find out about clinical trials. One is to ask the doctor or nurse who's taking care of you. We used to wear buttons. In fact, we're making them again that say, ask me about clinical trials, because we're very eager um, to discuss the possible use of um, experimental medicines um, in people who don't have a disease that is amenable to treatment with standard approaches. We also can direct people to electronic resources, such as the trial matching uh, program that the Cancer Research Institute has for people, or clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, a large website that is run by the National Institutes of Health, which can direct people toward clinical trials trials for which they may be eligible. One important concern that people have about clinical research is that they don't like being a quote-unquote guinea pig, um, and nobody wants any other person to feel like anything other than an equal human. Um, we want people to feel comfortable with clinical research, and as such, almost never um, do we use placebo-controlled trials anymore? So when someone enters into a clinical trial, you should specifically ask your investigation team whether there's a placebo involved. Still, there are some instances where there is no good standard of care that a placebo might be involved, but most cancer clinical trials, if they are randomized in some way where you know a, an electronic coin is flipped that decides which treatment you get, it's one treatment or another treatment, and not so often one treatment or no treatment. Many clinical trials, especially of very new medicines, do not have randomization. You, you will get the drug. You may get a different dose of drug um, as uh, the phases of clinical research go on and we learn what is safe, but most clinical trials will involve uh, a person receiving uh, an agent that um, is being looked at as a potential new treatment for cancer. Again, the most important thing that a person with cancer or their family members or caregivers can do is to simply ask their clinicians about clinical trials.